Good afternoon. Man. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the DMZ. I'm joining you. Longtime watchers will know that taping in the afternoon is very dangerous right. for Matt. Not at his peak energy level. You are, uh, low, you are energy low energy at this time of day. At yeah. this time of day. Um, this could be a very Jeb-like uh, episode we of will, the DMZ. Uh, we will survive. We'll survive. Yeah. It's nap time. And, and I'm also operating on a not much sleep since I was uh, in New York for CNN last night and up very late and uh, up early to fly back. So um, Media Matters, this is your, this is your chance. See what <laughs> gaps are committed. Are, 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 is, do you have a tracker now? Is, is there a Media Matters uh, tracker of trying to catch you into something all the well, time? Well, you never know when the lurkers might uh, might you know <laughs> rear their ugly heads. But no, I think I think I'm probably in the clear right now. Um, you may you may have problems though on your left flank, Bill Share. It's possible. There's always a risk. There's always a risk. You know, I, I have. Uh, uh, a lot of the Bernie supporters out there have been criticizing much of what I've written because I I tend to presume Hitler would be the nominee. I talk about the delegate math not being in his favor, and everyone's on on, on the Bernie side says I'm being I'm pre premature. I'm, I, it's the MSM trying to run him out of the race. Yada yada yada. Uh, but uh, after New York, I wrote a piece for Politico, which was more of a a formal post-mortem, uh, you know, what what went wrong with the Bernie campaign, really no, no, not even the slightest bit of hedging at this point. Uh, and, and while certainly I've gotten some uh, complaints from the Bernie side of things, I, I actually think that there is, uh, I wouldn't say complete resignation, but a higher degree of resignation in the Bernie camp that the nomination is not going to be his. Uh, uh, and I, I mean, I thought this would have been more evident, even, evident a long time ago after you have know, to say the March 15th sweep that she well, there had. Is a, there but, is a, I, I, don't, uh, I don't follow this very closely, um, but there is a talking point that says neither of them will show up at the convention with enough delegates and that the superdelegates are not allowed to announce whom they're voting for until the convention. Technically, well, they're allowed to they're, they're allowed to say whatever they want. They're what they utter publicly is meaningless until the convention. But as you know, the the media does track superdelegate support, and those you know the AP has her, has Hillary with about five hundred and two supers. CNN has it a little bit lower, a little under five hundred. I mean, so so here's the thing: you know, the Bernie campaign is saying accurately that. In all likelihood, at the end of all the contests, you know, she may have more pledge delegates. She may, she will, and since it's a two-person race, she will have the majority of pledge delegates. But supers are 15% of the total delegate pool. So, you, you, it, you, it's, so you have to get, um, I, think it's, I think it's like 58% of the pledged if you're actually to win the entire pool outright. And that's, that's pretty hard to do under proportional allocation rules. So, yeah, she's not going to have an outright majority on pledge delegates alone as of June 7th when everything is done except for the District of Columbia. But media institutions, particularly the Associated Press, which, you know, goes into every newspaper across the country practically, they track supers. They have Hillary at 500 supers. So, and I, I did some rough math myself, uh, you know, in all likelihood, you know, assuming she, if you, you give her half the remaining delegates, which I think is a pretty uh, safe presumption, those 500 supers put her over the top as of June 7th. Well, what's funny? Uh, so so you, you, will, you will see headlines on June 8th or the night of June 7th that say Hillary clinches on that, that basis. That, and the Bernie people are saying, we're still going to contest anyway. Yeah, I mean, what, this, this it, remind, the interesting thing is how, how Trump has started saying, you know, I, I, every, that Bernie wins all the time. He's all he does is win, and yet he can't, you know, he can't catch up. This is before New York. But, I mean, that does strike me as a little – I mean, you could argue that that's unfair, what they're doing. Well, as long as you report accurately. I mean, the, I mean, the accurate reporting would be on June 7th, 
Hillary won the most uh, delegates from the pledge pool. Hillary won the most states. And with the superdelegate uh, uh, surveys that we have done, presuming they hold, she will win the nomination at the convention. Uh, and the argument that Bernie can flip them without having won the most states, without having won the most pledged delegates, without having won the most popular votes, uh, there's just not a lot of basis for that. <laughs> you, know? I mean, you even have Move On, which earlier in the race did a petition demanding, uh, signed a petition to tell the DNC the pledged delegate winner should get the nomination. Don't let the supers overturn the will of the people. Uh, they are now saying publicly, we, we still mean that. If, if Hillary gets the most, she gets the most, and that should be the end of it. So uh, he's not going to have a unified front on that score. There's not this secret appetite among supers to, to take it from Hillary and give it to so, him. So I think the, well, what's the, the, interesting to me is, as you know, I've, I've written the book about all the problems on the right. And I wonder, we talked about this, we've talked about this uh, before, but I'm more and more curious if the, the schism between Bernie's people and Hillary's people, which is starting to heat up, it seems like, um, if that's just the product, sort of the cyclical nature of primaries, or if it actually is a microcosm of a larger, more serious split on the left that mostly has gone ignored, that, that, the, that the press is not really taught much about because everybody's so focused on the Republican schism. Well, I think there's both there. I mean, I, I think we're at a, the two weeks leading up to New York were as personally nasty as the race has gotten. Uh, and uh, because the Bernie tone was a lot more caustic than it had been, uh, you start so you already had a fair amount of antipathy towards Clinton uh, in the Bernie camp. I wouldn't say it's uniform, uh, but I wrote back in February. I wrote after after the Iowa caucuses that the fact that people were chanting "She's a liar" at the post Iowa Bernie event, hearing Hillary's uh, victory speech, already told you that there were some uh, you know deeper uh, problems afoot. Uh, some deeper divisions afoot within the party, uh, so so that's not that's not really new. But first time I'm aware of a, a day or two before the New York uh, vote, Hillary made a mention of Bernie at one of her rallies, and his name got booed by the audience. Uh, it's very common for Hillary's name to get booed at Bernie at Bernie rallies. And in fact, uh, there, Chuck Todd once even called Bernie out. Saying, "Hey, you used to admonish your audience when they booed to tell them not to do it. And you, we, we tracked. You stopped doing that." And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and you know and moved on to something else. Uh, so, but now the Hillary supporters are starting to get angrier and starting to be less um, uh, less friendly towards Bernie as a candidate. I mean, some people on the Bernie side saying, "Hey, you've been me. You've been calling us Bernie Bros forever," and I think that's true. But that was directed to the supporters. The Hillary people have generally said, look, Bernie's a good guy. He means well, and we agree with him on lots of things. We just don't think he's electable. Now it's starting to be, hey, you are you're, you're are, uh, damaging Hillary personally. You're challenging her integrity. You're twisting her words around. You're not being fair to her. So that, you know, that acrimony What is Bernie, when they say Bernie bros, but, what exactly, what does that mean? Yeah. What do you hear? Well... I mean, it is a, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, aggressive behavior on social media. Uh, I think so, you know, Larry David made a joke about you know, how annoying it is to get five Bernie Facebook posts in your feed from your friends every day. You know, there's a lot of that uh, going on. Uh, but on the, uh, on the Hillary side is an accusation that you have these you know, young mansplainers uh, lecturing people about how awful Hillary is, and that, uh, and, and there is a condescending nature to that. People on the Bernie side have said, 
wait a second, that's you, you are now trivializing and generalizing Bernie supporters uh, who are not all men. Uh, they're they're you know Hill, uh, Bernie does very well with young women uh, as well with young men, uh, and as and as plenty of evidence that he does well with uh, young people of color to boot. So uh, you are creating this false impression of what the of what the Bernie uh, movement is really like. So that's been out there you know, for a while, uh, but now the acrimony, uh, the finger points become between the two candidates themselves. So I, I think the question going forward is, is this like 2008 where it was very similar and the candidates are very caustic and the supporters were very nasty online, but they got, they, they reunited at the end of the day and they won the general election very handily. Uh, or is this a deeper ideological schism that poses mm -hmm. problems in the future. And I think, I think it's more like that. Yeah, than well, 2008. I think, I, I think it might uh, be that America is undergoing a major change and Barack Obama masked that on the democratic side. So he basically postponed having to deal with that. Um, but well, I don't, I wouldn't call it a mask because a lot of has to do with Obama. Um, there was a sense, you know, I mean, there, there, there is a Rorschach on the Democratic side. What has the eight years of, of Obama meant? And the, the, the positive take is that this was, this was a great presidency. We got lots of big things done. Um, we, uh, we, we were able to do Obamacare and the Recovery Act and Dodd-Frank and the, the economy turned around and jobs are growing and, uh, there's, a lot of, there's, there's more work to do, but we have a good foundation to build to build from. And the and the the negative take is is that this is all woefully insufficient. The economy is still terrible. Wages are still stagnant, and a big part of the problem is the Democrats are too wedded to uh, big corporate donations uh, and too uh, obsessed with trying to. Uh, work with the other side in Congress and not propose bigger ideas and and press Congress to do bigger things. Uh, so that divide is a real divide, and so I, I, I don't so I don't think it's necessarily what's being masked eight years ago. It's just how do you interpret what has just happened, and that's not going to be uh, healed. Is it fair to say that the Bernie uh, people are more inclined to say that? the last eight years have been disappointing and that the Hillary people are more likely to, to say that the last eight years have been awesome. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean that's it. There are exit poll questions that ask that specifically, do you think we need to be, uh, to, to emulate Obama's policies or be more liberal than Obama was? And if there's a clear Hillary Bernie split um, with that. Uh, so that is a main, and, and that, and that speaks to the generational, divide as well, because the older Democrats know how hard it was to get to this point. And so they're very generous to how Obama has done as well as he has. And the younger voters um, uh, look at history and say, this is all oh, terrible. And uh, we don't accept that. Uh, well, this is as good as me, we can do. We think well, we can do even better. It strikes me as really surprising that young, that young liberals wouldn't love Obama like they you know he was Bernie in a way I mean I know Bernie thought about prime about challenging him at some point but I mean if you're young if you're a young idealistic progressive shouldn't Barack Obama be like a god to you well I, I you know what I think is correct and I'm and I'm not alone in this is the the 2008 crash was a scarring experience for millennials. This is their first big political event that shapes their views. This is, you know, akin to Vietnam in the 60s. It's a radicalizing event. Uh, and just like in the 60s, that radicalizing event drove young people to Eugene McCarthy, uh, which was a great piece in Politico today by, by, by Julian uh, uh, Selzer um, about how the McCarthy folks were so angry that uh, the Democratic Party establishment gave the nomination to Hubert Humphrey, even though Humphrey didn't even compete in the primaries, and McCarthy wouldn't endorse uh, coming out of the convention and 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 arguably depressed the Democratic vote in '68. Uh, and then 
uh, those voters went to George McGovern in 72, and McGovern got that nomination with a with a very small, uh, like he lost the popular vote to Hubert Humphrey in 72 by a little bit. He, uh, it was only 25% of the popular vote that, that McGovern got. Uh, but they were so angry about what happened in 68 and angry about, uh, about the war, and Humphrey was tied to Lyndon Johnson, even though Humphrey was quite, quite liberal, uh, didn't want to, didn't want to, I mean, here's like, you know, Hubert Humphrey, the guy who single-handedly made the Democratic Party a civil rights party in 1948, meant nothing to those younger voters because they were so angry about Vietnam and, and Humphrey being Johnson's VP was tarred with it. So Obama, uh, you know, it looked upon as someone who's going to turn things around and, you know, and does something like Dodd-Frank, which regulates Wall Street, but doesn't break up Wall Street. Uh, he stops the bleeding of the recession, but he doesn't do $15 minimum wage. Uh, he, he does Obamacare, but that keeps the private insurance company still in business. Doesn't do Medicare for all. So all those things are not impressive to a generation that has been radicalized on economic issues, at least as of this moment. So uh, I don't think that gets immediately solved in the next six months. Now, I don't, know, I don't think that means that uh, it's 68 Redux and none of these Bernie supporters vote for Hillary at the end of the day. The polling right now doesn't suggest that. And usually these passions cool to some degree between the peak of the primary season explain and the general to me election. Why, explain uh, to me why I would say, uh, Vietnam was the analogy. And in the yeah. um, 60s and you know late 60s, early 70s, um, you, know, you, you had a potential to be, to be drafted. Uh, the, you know, there was all sorts of turmoil. You had the civil rights stuff happening. Um, why would the the recession, the Great Recession, be so impactful on these young people as to radicalize them to this degree? Was it because they had been sort of promised something, expectations that they would graduate from college? Everybody gets a participation trophy and things are going to be easy why was that so such a big i mean we've been through economic downturns before there was one in 19 in the early 1990s there was one in the early 1980s why was this one but the both but both of those both of those recessions were brief and even still i mean you know the 81 recession led to a bad midterm for republicans in 82 and the 91 recession, even though it was effectively over by 92, it was still, the effects were kind of lingering and it still, you know, denied George H.W. Yeah, Bush fair point. Israel and he had, had, he had had, had high, you know, sky no, high approval ratings. Um, but I don't know that there was but this movement is, this is a, to the degree. That, that seemed to be more of um, voters reacting organically as opposed to an or, sort of a more organized thing. Right. Well, th this is a different kind of recession. It's a financial crisis recession, which historically have much longer recovery times. And there is a feeling, particularly amongst uh, millennials, that their economic prospects have been severely damaged, that they, that they should be better off than they are right now because of what Wall Street did to them. Uh, and that their prospects are not going to get better, that the recovery is not going to lift up, the, lift their boats uh, as they move forward in their lives. So it may not be as uh, searing an experience as Vietnam, where you're, you're seeing yeah. your friends literally being sent off to die, but there still is a sense of personal impact of to you. Wall it's not Street abstract. Did to them. Now, so there this is, is a, interesting to me. So first of all, I would assume that people who are like, nearing retirement who saw their nest egg disappear would be the ones who were most hurt by the recession. Um, the other thing too is the whole like, well, the, well, the market's Wall recovered Street though. did to me, like I've lived my entire life assuming that the, the game is rigged and people are out to get you and you have to just find a way to, to like survive and to, and to thrive despite all of that. You know what I mean? It, it's interesting to me. Now there's a, there's another argument. It's not it, it's not uh, as often articulated. Uh, you don't see a lot of Democrats eager to make this point. But uh, I believe it was, it was Zachary Carabell who writes for who's a contributing editor to, to contributing editor to Political Magazine. He wrote a piece basically saying that uh, the millennials are not in that bad economic position. That they have a, they have a false expectation of, of how far yeah. along they should be 
at this point. And it may well be that in 10 years, they're going to feel differently about their economic But uh, why position. do they have this false and, expectation? This, That's what I would like to know. Like, why, where does the expectation come from that you will be doing great at the age of 25 or something? Well, I think there's a, I mean, when, uh, I graduated in 1994, uh, and there was a lot of commentary back then that things were not going to be as good for you as they were for your, for your, for the prior generation, that the, the job market great is in the worse 90s, and your earning, your earning potential is I just worse. had a whole conversation. <laughs> this is, I just had a whole 90s. conversation in my office This is yesterday. still the, Pound for pound, you know, every, every decade's got problems, Bill, but I, I and then, maybe this is nostalgia, but I feel like pound for pound. It's hard to beat the nineties. Well, but we were early nineties. We we're still coming out of the Bush recession of ninety one. Things hadn't really, you know, kicked in uh, firmly yet. Uh, so late nineties, there was a different perception. Uh, so, but the point is that there's been a kind of periodic narrative that things will be worse for you than 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 your parents. And that has only been, you know, tenfold coming out of the 2008 uh, crash. So, uh, so I, th I think that sense has really taken think, hold. And I'm sorry to keep interrupting. I, just, I, I find this so interesting because, no, like, you know, that's – you cannot extrapolate a sort of anecdotal personal experience. But, um, you know, my dad, as you know, as I've, I've talked about numerous times, is a prison guard – I'm doing this, I talk about politics. And my kids should have a better life. Now, again, a lot of other people, uh, a lot of my family, you know, the other, it's sort of the other direction. Um, their, you know, their kids aren't doing uh, as well. Uh, in fact, some of my peers, my cousins, uh, in a sense, didn't do as well uh, as their parents. But I just I just wonder about I, I was at a um, I was at a, a big conservative event a couple of years ago, and I think it was Frank Luntz who asked people to raise their hands. These are rich Republicans, all rich, like very rich Republicans. Uh, asked them to raise their hands if they thought their kids would have a better future than they had, and I think I might have been the only person to raise my hand. As long as America holds together. And that's a big if at this point. But as long as America holds together, there's no reason that my kids shouldn't do better than me as far as I'm concerned. Like, and, and if they don't, then that's kind of an indictment on me. You know what I'm saying? So anyway. Well, I think that, I, I think how that goes over the next 10 years matters a great deal as to can the democratic divide eventually heal? Because, uh, as I, I wrote about this in my Politico piece uh, today, um, especially why, why, the, why the revolution failed, uh, and I'm not arguing that it has failed forevermore and, the, and, the, and it will never live on after today, but obviously it has fallen short as of this campaign. Um, and one of, the, uh, you know, one of the arguments is, and, and you saw uh, Jamel Bowie make this in Slate, and uh, James Downey made this point in the Washington Post, you know, all the Bernie backers need to do to win the day in the Democratic Party is be part of the Democratic Party because the older voters are going to die off and Nancy Pelosi is going to retire and you know, Chuck Schumer is going to retire and uh, you know, the, the, the world is yours. You know, just get, get involved in your local Democratic, par Democratic Party uh, committees yeah. and organizations and run for office and you'll, you'll, you'll own the party. Um, but if it's just about, you know, age... I don't think you can assume that all they have to do is just continue to live. Uh, because um, uh, to get to what we're talking about here, which I didn't talk about in, in, in significantly in the piece, but uh, I do believe this. If the, if the economy continues to grow steadily, oh, it, let's assume Hillary's president for eight years, the economy under her is generally good. Uh, the young person's radicalism today may may quickly cool. Say, so, oh, things aren't as bad as I thought. Right, and now be. they've and got and now they've like now they've got pretty good. married and they've got a couple kids and they're going to PTA right. meetings and maybe they've put some right. money away and, and investments and 
I mean, life changes. And, and, and it's interesting. There is an argument right. that says you can never change hearts and minds. You just have to outlive people. Like uh, attrition is the way that you have ultimately have change, you know. Um, but then right. you, what you're describing is more of a catch-22. And I wonder about the same thing in terms of like um, – like when it, when when people talk about like, oh well, all the Republicans are in trouble because all the old people who vote watch Fox News are they're all old and, and they're going to die. And it's like, well, it could be that there's something specific about this generation of old people that makes them watch Fox News and vote Republican, or it could be that as people get old, they start watching Fox News and voting Republican. In which case, your problem if you're rooting if you're a Democrat will not be solved by that. Um, and there's more and more, right. well, there's going to be a lot I mean, of old people. Now, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I think there's evidence that, you know, people, you know, can get more modern as they get older. There's also evidence that people stick with their party as they get older, that you, 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 you achieve yeah. party loyalty at an early By age the way, like, there's some uh, weird stuff going on too with, um, uh, about a year ago, I remember I was listening to, um, I think Kathy, I think was Kathy Griffin was on like Mark Maron's show. I think it was Mark Maron's podcast. And Kathy Griffin was talking about how her mom became like a huge Fox News fan. And her mom like is like a hardcore right winger now. And I was just listening to this podcast with uh, Hannah Rosen. Is that her name? Anyway, um, she. As a yeah, Slate. Slate. Podcast. And um, her mom, who I think is New York Jewish liberal, is a huge Trump supporter at this point. So um, it is interesting how that can sometimes happen, and, and Trump is tapping I mean, into some. There, there, there are anecdotal things like that, but we don't see in the polling that those are that these are massive shifts going. This up. could just be like anecdotal. I don't know, but yeah. but keep your. Well, I, I, I know we talked a lot about about my piece and Bernie, but I do want to just yeah. make a couple of yeah. points about the piece before we shift to the Republican side because uh, I do think it's important if you're a Bernie supporter, I mean, if you don't, if you don't like the fact that I'm talking about the campaign being essentially over, you, you want the revolution to persevere. You want there to be a light life beyond this campaign. So I think it's worth having a clinical look, what went right and what went wrong. And obviously the things that went right, you know, he, he, he won 16 States out of 35 so far. Uh, he, he polls competitively with, with Hillary nationally. He, he's polling ahead of all the Republican candidates and, I think probably more importantly for the the policy goals, he moved Hillary on trade, on minimum wage, um, to some degree on Wall Street, uh, to some degree on fracking, uh, and uh, and so you can there there are a lot of moral victories to be said about what he has accomplished. I mean, just even just legitimizing you can be a democratic socialist and not be laughed out of town in and of itself is an accomplishment, um, but. There is a a uh, predictable obstacle for the ideological crusader to get over the hump and actually win, uh, and that is answering the question: Is what you're proposing uh, practical and feasible? I mean, is, is is it practical on a policy basis, and is it feasible on a political basis? And as much as he convinced younger voters that it was. He did not do very well convincing older voters that it was. And the worst example of this was the Daily News interview, which I know the Bernie people still feel was a bit of an ambush. But and and there's commentary out there, you know, there's a bit of a wonk war that's gone on between Clinton friendly wonks and Bernie friendly wonks, which I would argue Bernie lost. I mean, he has his defenders, of course, but at the end of the day, he didn't convince enough people that he had the policy depth and the political savvy to execute what he was proposing, and that's why he couldn't break through in Hillary-friendly uh, turf. Uh, so I, I don't think that's a problem that gets solved with time. I think you actually have to think through. I mean, you, you could say there are there were ways to explain what Bernie did in the mm-hmm. news interview, but it's incumbent upon him to fill in the blanks. It's not incumbent upon his defenders to fill in the blanks. You have to prove... You've thought through this backwards and forwards, and have a, and and have thought through the contingencies, and not just wave them off as as being uh, as cheap shots. The contingencies both both on the policy. Where and the do you come down basis. on the? Where do you come down uh, on so, the question of was did Bernie create this? Is this a Bernie phenomenon, or is does he just the vessel 
that people are using? I would say, I would lean more towards him being a vessel. Um, I mean, I think he, I mean, he, the reason why I did not expect this to go as well as it did was that I did not foresee the under 30 crowd breaking that, that dramatically his way and, and, and underestimating how radicalized they had become on these issues. Uh, but I think that shows that anybody articulating that kind of message was going to win those votes. I don't think there, I mean, there are certain things that Bernie did well. Uh, his message discipline is, is fantastic, for example. Uh, so he didn't do goofy things like Dennis Kucinich did, like start talking about UFOs that might have made him seem like a less credible candidate. So uh, he gets some personal credit on that score. I think his, I think his team had a smart rollout strategy organizing these large rallies early to establish his, uh, his potential. Uh, and I think he also hired a good enough team of people that knew how to put together the online operation. They've made great advancements in um, uh, creating a system where people could, uh, could freelance volunteer and organize on their own and actually connect with other Bernie people in their areas and, 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 and create synergies through that. But those are, that didn't come out of Bernie's head. Bernie is not a technological marvel. Well, neither, was, neither was Howard What Dean. Bernie likes to do... Right, right. But Bernie, what he wanted to do in this campaign was give his one-hour speech that he has been honing <laughs> for his decades in political life and show that his speech had resonance in the country. And uh, if you want to win an election, you need you can't be that rigid. Your know, message, message, message discipline is good, but you got to be a little agile at times too, and that's not his thing. I mean, so I think he showed his message has a degree of of residents, certainly with younger voters, but couldn't break through with older voters and couldn't break through in bigger primary states. So, uh, so that, that's where I feel like uh, you, you can't look at this and just say it's all it, it, it's it's all just going to flow from here. Uh, there's more you need, you need to do to build upon what he has done if you want this to to go further. In so, the uh, TMZ and Hollywood Reporter say that Prince, the legendary artist known as Prince, is dead. Legendary what? artist Prince found you can't, dead you can't, at fifty-seven. You, you cannot, you cannot tell me that in the middle of a DMZ. What are you well, talking about? You know, usually they're right. Hopefully they're not. But um, that's what I'm seeing on the internet. And uh, of course, the Charlie Charlie Murphy uh, true true uh, Hollywood stories will be. Uh, if this is true, we'll certainly be remembered as well as a great catalog, uh, and a, and a couple, at least one one uh, pretty successful movie. So uh, anyway, sorry, uh, sorry to drop that on you. So I I, I, <clears throat> I need to. Tell is your, my is wife. your wife a big Prince fan? Yeah, He's oh a yeah. Super talented musician, man. No doubt about that. Super talented musician. I, I got to see him live once. Did you really? Uh, with my wife, I did in in, in in Philadelphia. Fantastic show. I I um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to keep it together for DMZ so purposes. Page six, but, man. Uh, yeah. Page six. Uh, Prince dies at fifty-seven. That is uh, that, that, that's, that, that's not right. That's just not right. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna try yeah, to bring it back please. now. All right. Uh, Let's uh let's let's go to the Republican side here. Uh, so coming off of Wisconsin, uh, Cruz, uh, when Cruz won, people thought, okay, the, Trump is really on his heels. Um, clearly the, you know, the the roof is caving in. He can't break out. He, he can't break fifty percent in any of these states. Um, he's going to come up short of a majority of delegates. And Cruz is winning these these delegate battles at the state convention level, so things are looking good. He coming to New York, he proudly sweeps the delegates. Cruz comes in third place with a whole lot of Northeast states coming up next week. Uh, there's still a big question 
whether Trump can get to an outright majority. And, uh, and you know, uh, Nate Cohen has a good breakdown of this at, at the New York Times and 538 then has a good delegate, delegate calculator for this too. Uh, I mean, he really has to sweep New York and win Indiana and do extremely well in California uh, if he was to get an outright majority. But even if he just does very well in the Northeast and he does win Indiana, and he does okay in California, he's still, in, 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 I would think, likely to be within 100 delegates. Um, still, and still, you know, not, not, it's not like his momentum just completely mm -hmm. peters out by And then the question June. is, can he, can he get so, enough, you know, on the first ballot? Um, because there'll be, a, there'll be a couple hundred. But, but if, he's, if he's within 100, if he's within 100, he could win first ballot with yeah, unbound, delegates. unbound delegates. Yeah, because there would be unbound delegates. 54, I think, in Pennsylvania. Right. So would would there be enough distance between himself and Cruz? Where we, It's not like Cruz is running close second in place. If he's getting wiped out in the Northeast, uh, then does he have a case to make to the unbound, hold off, I'm still viable here, or has he just become too damaged for that to happen? Well, I just think that, you know, I, Cruz... New York obviously was bad, very bad for Cruz because he comes off momentum. He'd won a whole bunch of states and had that huge win in Wisconsin. And everybody knew that Trump was going to win New York. But, you know, if Cruz comes in second, picks up a dozen delegates or whatever, uh, wins a few congressional, a couple congressional districts or something, uh, then I think, you know, he, is, he would have like sort of cemented himself as a strong uh, as the as the strong sort of anti-Trump alternative, but he didn't do that, and it just I I think that it will go to a convention, but it's harder to deny tr Trump the nomination um, if Cruz doesn't appear to have momentum and to be strong. Now, of course, if, you know. Cruz has to endure a couple of bad weeks, and then theoretically he can win like Nebraska and Indiana and do well in California. And this New York might all be forgotten. You just say, oh, it's Trump's home state. You know, wow, he, he won his home state. Big, big whoop. Um, but, you know, but it's certainly not a good week for Ted Cruz. Uh, the interesting thing as well is, is, will, is, is Trump, you know, it's unclear whether or not Trump is... Um, is going to sort of moderate his message uh, if he can stick to it, and and if Paul Manafort and um, Rick Wiley, the the new operatives, the sort of seasoned veteran political operatives that now are working for Trump, if they will be able to um, start you know doing a better job of working with delegates and and certainly you know. Um, there will be horse trading. If, if Trump is within, you know, 100 delegates, um, you know, there there will be horse trading. And, and, and having those guys on the floor cutting deals could be the difference, you know, between Trump winning on a first ballot or not. Because I think we all sort of assume Trump has to win on the first ballot. He has to win before the convention or on the first ballot. Otherwise, Cruz would probably win on the second or third ballot. If it goes beyond that, then I think there is still the slim possibility of, of the so-called white knight emerging. <clears throat> now, Cruz did an interview with yeah. Sean Hannity where Hannity is asking Cruz about, you know, uh, is, essentially, is it fair that he's winning, winning all these delegates in in these state party processes, even in states where Trump, Trump won. Uh, and when, when Cruz tried to dismiss the question as being just something that comes from Trump fans, Handy got, got angry with him, which I, I don't believe I've ever seen Sean Handy get angry with a Republican guest in my entire life. He basically just puffs up whatever Republican, you know, is in, is in the chair next to him. Uh, but he scolded Cruz and say, this is not coming just from Trump people. I'm on 550 radio stations. I'm, I have millions of me followers on social media. I hear this all the time. It's confusing to people. You know, why can't you just answer the question and explain this? Um, 
So I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about about you know Sean Hannity's role in all of this. But just to, but to stay on the the delegate question for a second, do you think that there is a broad <clears throat> belief in, in amongst the Republican rank and file beyond Trump fans that it's unfair? for Cruz to get these delegates and that it would be wrong for him to win the, the nomination well, in this way. So let me say this. I think first, um, I think this is Hannity's radio show for what that's worth. Um, I thought I agreed with Hannity on the specific incident because he was asking Cruz a process question about the delegates and Cruz was trying to spin him and just parry the question and basically say, well, the real thing is, how are we going to get jobs going? You know, he was he was basically dodging a legitimate question about, like, is it fair to sort of, like, you know, rest a nomination from somebody that has a plurality of the votes? That's a legitimate question. And, and, and Cruz was trying to, like, poo-poo that as an illegitimate question. My phone's ringing. Um, and, and I, and I, I give Hannity a little credit for pushing back. And, and I think it was a, a real sense of frustration. I mean, Cruz is trying to dodge the question and you have to be that way sometimes. Now the question is like, would, would Hannity have ever done that to Trump? And a lot of people would say no, that Hannity's in the tank for Trump. I'll tell you this, for me, the sort of interesting thing has been, um, the, the sort of, the way that, you know, there was a time when I feel like a lot of conservatives would have never said anything publicly critical of someone like Sean Hannity. And now they are. Like, even, even people at Fox, like Greg Gutfeld and, and, and Jonah Goldberg, I see sort of mocking his uh, Trump sycophancy um, on Twitter, like publicly. And I'm seeing lots of, like, conservative journalists and and bloggers and whatnot sort of mocking Hannity publicly. And he's not the only one. And I just, I, I find that sort of notable because I think there was a time when you would have been afraid to do that. If for no other reason, then you would have thought like, well, maybe someday Hannity will have me on his show. So I better not like make an enemy here. And so I think that there's an interesting thing. This happens like in sports, like for a long time, people were afraid of Tiger Woods and and there's a psychological benefit, but like once all of a sudden that people see like a, a, a chink in the armor, um, then, then you sort of have a permission structure to go after somebody. And I feel like um, this is just another example of how the, um, you know, there, there are like, nobody's safe. Nobody, um, nobody has like the, the, um, the, you know, the imprimatur and, and, and the, um, like nobody's beyond, there's nobody too big to mock anymore. Um, and, and maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, but it struck me as, it strikes me as interesting because I, I do not think so many people would have done that in the past. So do you, do you think that it, it is it necessary for Cruz to win this spin war about the delegates before the convention starts. If he loses the spin war, if, he, if, if, if I mean, Trump is making, and I, and we, I think we talked about this a little bit on the last show, but if Trump is making the argument that this is rigged, you know, at full blast yeah. for two months, and, and Cruz can't make his case without getting smacked down by conservative talk radio show hosts, how, how do you convince the unbound delegates to break? So Trump? I think there's like two different things happening here. In this case, I do want to finish on. I, I do want to defend Sean Hannity because he was not. He asked a very reasonable question, which Cruz could have answered, and in fact did answer. That was actually the good thing about it is that if you listen to the full interview, Hannity actually elicited a much more interesting answer than the than the soundbite the talking points Cruz was trying to give him. And it was a legitimate question. Um, Hannity in this instance, at least, now maybe there's a backstory here that I don't know about, but in this instance, specifically, Hannity was not um, criticizing the notion that 
um, that somebody other than than the front runner could win in a contested convention. He was just asking Cruz to talk about that and to give his side of it. And Cruz was like, that's what Trump people want me to say. That's what you know, they want to talk about process. I want to talk about jobs. I want to talk about, I can't even do the, I, don't, I, I can't figure out what the Cruz <laughs> accent is. It, it's bizarre, but. It, it, it has to be kind of whiny and smarmy. I don't know. It's sort of like aristocratic, but also Southern and also like televangelist. <laughs> but I, I can't, I would love to have someone who's like a, a great, if you're out there and you study voices, I would love to to figure out how to do an impersonation of him or what, like, what, like, what is the dialect? Where does it, is it Canadian Texas? I don't know. Have, have you seen a, have you seen a bad lip yeah. reading before? Yeah. There, there, there's a bad lip reading of Ted Cruz where I think they, they, they do the whiny smarmy voice <laughs> very well. Um, but I will say this, I, we talked about it last week, I think, Phil, but, um, but it's easier to make Trump's argument. And Trump's argument is about fairness and about democracy. I mean, let me just say, if it were up to me, we wouldn't even have direct election of U.S. senators. So that doesn't appeal to me. But I get, I'm serious, but I get that the average person, like, fetishizes direct democracy and, and all that stuff. And I think, so Trump has had a better PR. It's easier for Trump to make the case. Well, should maybe, maybe Cruz should just go all, you know, Sixteenth uh, Amendment on this and be like, "Let's get back to our republic." Well, I would roots. say, I, why are we fetishizing direct democracy? It's not how it's a losing works. argument we, we need... because it requires somebody being educated uh, and, and and knowing about. Uh... But but his 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 base are the the constitutionalist yeah. conservatives. They they should they should intrinsically they get should. what he's talking about. They should. Um, but these are the you know, what I won't go into. It. Um. But I will say this. I heard last night on Anderson Cooper an interview with uh, Sean Spicer from the RNC who did – I'm thinking I'm going to blog about this today, actually. He did the best job I've heard of anybody in the Republican Party so far doing to explain their side of it. And he – it's not surprising to regular DMZ listeners that I like the fact that he used the football analogy, which is – you don't, we don't give you a touchdown if you get close. Like, if you get to the two yard line, we don't give you five points. You know what I mean? Or, like, like you've got, you've got to go in the end zone to get, so to get a touchdown. And so the number isn't 1200 or 11, it, it's, it's 1237, right? And like, if Trump gets to 1237, then he will have gotten in the end zone and he will be the nominee. And if he doesn't, then, Somebody, somebody will eventually get to 1237. And I don't know. He said it more eloquently than me. I'm going to try to find the video. But uh, no, I, 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 saw, I saw a crew surrogate making this point, too, on MSNBC. He was when did they make that? Line. When did they make that? Metaphor. It was, it was just okay. a day I, I want to know who. I think, I think, I think I I they came up New York. first. Because they finally, I think they finally, they finally got it right. It's as good as they can get it. <laughs> but I think in the course of her doing that, yeah, you know, he, she she talked about how Trump has not won fifty percent of the votes, and the obvious comeback is, well, you've won less. Right? So why you are even, you are even farther from the five year yeah, line than he is? About, so it's it's why about, so we get the, about delegates and whoever gets twelve thirty seven delegates? Well, you're basically arguing that Trump's on the five yard line, you're on the forty yard line. Play should be frozen. And a bunch of referees, you could get to pick you up off the forty-yard line and carry you over into the end zone. see the analogy slightly different. Well, everyone gets to stop and stare. Yeah, how about this? How about this? The game goes into overtime. You know, it's it, 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 it's 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 a tie game. Well, I mean, it's a tie I, I, game I, I, until he gets into the end zone. That's that's the analogy. Well, you know, you know, my view on this is well, before I, I think the 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 legitimate argument to make is that no one got in the end zone. Like we got to. We need a substitution. We need someone who who, who hasn't played Bring the game the back, yet. Or lost. Backup quarterback. Or uh, Jack Kemp when you need him. Right. But if you can't, if if the white knight scenario is not allowed, I mean, you 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 already have Paul Ryan who discounted the idea as being illegitimate, and now there's a question: Will the rules yeah, allow it? And if, if you if the if the if the old rule stays in place, and it's not it's not a, it's a, it's, a, it's not a long standing rule. It's a rule just made for 2012 that you have to have majority of delegates in eight states to even be nominated, 
the convention can yeah, change that. I don't know how you can change that. The Cruz right. and Trump delegates will have to choose to change it. Neither exactly. side might want to do that. I don't think they can change it because how do you change it if if if, if Trump and Cruz both want the rule to stay? I don't know how you can change it. I mean, only if they have a you have you have so many you know disloyal delegates and the word comes up high, time to time to that flip your vote and they do it. To me. Uh, but. I I agree. I that I I have a hard time seeing how this is yeah. denied the truth. Now um, we should probably start wrapping it up, but I do want to say uh, Noah Rothman here. I think he's a commentary tweeted it. This list of people who have passed away this year: David Bowie, Gary Shandling, Alan Rickman, Harper Lee, Merle Haggard, and there are more, and possibly. Uh, reportedly Prince. So this has been a rough this has been a rough year already uh, for for famous celebrities. So, yeah. It's not right. It's not right. Uh, everybody has their time, but uh, you know, particularly in the case of Prince, the, the, the guy was still creating. Yeah, totally, but I mean, you they're, know, they're, they're... Um, a lot of these, they, I mean, Gary Shandling was, was pretty young. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, it's just, uh, sad. Uh, well, anyway, not to be, a, not to be a bummer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the thing with, uh, with live taping here. We, you know, go to the breaking news sometimes. You, you have, a, you have a commitment right. to the news. I will, uh, I one will, eye on I you, forgive. one eye on the, uh, on the Twitter feed, Bill. That's how we roll. So, all right, sir. All right, uh, we good, will good show. Uh, aside from the uh, the sad news, um, I am very. I, I, I will say this. This bill. I think this is the first week where I'm more interested in your side of the aisle than my side of the aisle. I think. <laughs> I think some. Well, it's it, is it exciting that perhaps you're not the only party that is about to disintegrate. Yes, it actually is. It's uh, <laughs> best. I wouldn't get too excited. I don't yeah. think it's that bad, but I do think there's and um, and, 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 and maybe we should talk about it another show. But I do think it does raise some questions as far as how how easy will it be for a President Clinton to govern? I mean, she she she, she would need. A fair amount of un of unity on her side to get anything passed. If uh, and I think Sanders forces it potentially have leverage to you know scuttle bipartisan deals, for example. So uh, you know trade deals look to be very difficult to get passed in this kind of environment. So the, the, yeah. those sorts of things are are uh, are relevant, even if even if it doesn't hurt her. Uh, I didn't want to plug the podcast real quick. My Matt Lewis and the News podcast. All right. uh, we just had Ron Fournier on at our, uh, talking about his book uh, oh. Love That Boy. And um, I'm supposed to talk to Ken Cuccinelli tomorrow about stuff, including uh, right on crime. But he is one of the top Ted Cruz delegate hunters. Um, so I hope we get into that as well. So check out the podcast. And uh, Reed Bill shares Politico magazine piece on Bernie Sanders as well. And uh, also see my real clear politics piece from Monday. No, our primaries are not I like rigged. That. Um, I'm, I think I'm have to bookmark that one. Maybe we have to send that one out to the uh, RNC as well. All right, buddy. Yeah. Good show. Uh, same here. Uh, I will talk to you next week.